One of our foremost scholars and interpreters of the world's religions, Houston Smith has been leading students into the heart of the religious experience since the early 40s. Born in China in 1919, the son of American missionaries, he was surrounded during childhood by a culture that accommodated a rich variety of religious beliefs. This variety finds expression in his now classic work, first published when he was only 38 years old and since read by millions. The chapters on Confucianism and Taoism, two of the traditions we explore in this program, are among his most eloquent. What he has learned, he has applied to life. Spiritual practices like yoga, which concludes this program, inform his daily journey. But we begin with the yin-yang, symbol of the Taoist approach to life. The yin yang, symbolizing the opposites of life, not divided by a razor sharp line, good on one side, evil on the other. Each takes up its abode in the deepest citadel of the other by virtue of the black dot in the white domain and the white dot in the black domain. Symbolizing the mystery of the relationship between the opposites that characterize and make up our lives and how they can be united, brought together. Oh, how many <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> elevates me to <laughs> look at that. <laughs> 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 Chinese will say you can learn more about life by contemplating this yin-yang symbol. Of course, this comes out in many stories. Let me tell you a short one because it's one of my favorites about the man who, uh, whose horse ran away and his neighbor Solicitus comes over to commiserate with him and all the man says, who knows what's good and bad. And sure enough, the next day, the horse returned with a drove of wild horses that it had encountered. So now the man was rich with horses. So the neighbor comes hopping over to congratulate him on his good fortune. And again, all the man would say is, who knows what's good or bad? And sure enough, the next day, his son, tries to ride one of the uh, wild horses, falls off, break his leg. Again, the commiseration, and again, the same response, who knows? And uh, once more, who does know? Because the next day the military came conscripting for the army, and the son didn't have to go because of the broken leg. It's a simple parable, but it just illustrates the intertwining of these things that we tend to put in different boxes and think of them as the sharp antagonists. And what does this say about the essence of Confucianism then? Let me say that uh, Confucianism and Taoism are not uh, divided, and this is part of the yin-yang, in sharp compartments. It's really not accurate to think of them as different 
uh, reli uh, religions because it's more like a single religion that in Chinese they would call it the Da Zhao. Uh, which uh, church are you belong to? I belong to the Great Church, of course, which includes Confucianism and Taoism and Buddhism and a good smattering of shamanism and folk religion thrown in. Every Chinese traditionally was a Confucianist on state occasions, like our Memorial Day parade and things like that. Uh, when illness fell, they would call in the Taoist sages up in the mountains. They know about these healing herbs and also they know about spirit. And then when death comes, why well, then you come uh, call in the Buddhist priest because they knew about these afterlife, reincarnation, and other realm. We Chinese, you know, we're flat-footed. We don't know. We know about this world, but you can't be too safe and careful. So we better tap their wisdom about what's going to happen after that. So, as I say, all three of these uh, uh, coalesce into one. And if I can take the time for a little uh, enjoyable anecdote, a long time ago when I was explaining this principle about how in China the religions are related differently than in the West, not as competitors, why the next day a student brought me a Dear Abbey column which made this point with a graphicness I could not have conceived. It was a short letter, I'll read it, uh, 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 I'll remember it. Uh, Dear Abby, I am uh, 31 years old uh, uh, and attractive, and I'm interested in religion. Uh, I am a member of the First Methodist Church, Blessed Angels Catholic Church, and Vanea Muna Synagogue. Uh, I also attend Christian Science Services, uh, though I do take aspirin occasionally. <laughs> Uh, please, I'm interested in getting married. Can you tell me how I can meet a man who is interested in any or all of these religions? Signed, Ida. Now comes back, Abby. Dear Ida, you seem to have the bases covered. And then, but now, the last time. I do not see how you can belong to all these religions. Well, of course, Abby couldn't see that because she was Western. But for a Chinese, there would be no problem at all because these religions service different components of the human self. And you ask, how does this relate to Confucianism? Well, this basic attitude toward the intertwining of the opposite just pervades all Chinese culture. And if we want to be literal, we can say Confucianism and Taoism, too, are in this whole, but each laps over into the domain of the other. You were strongly influenced, were you not, by growing up in China. I mean, you began in this small village, right? <laughs> Zangzhou. That's my hometown. It's located 70 miles northwest of Shanghai. And the only way we could get to Shanghai was five hours by barge and another hour on a train from Suzhou. Every childhood, if you know nothing different, seems perfectly ordinary, the way the world is ordained. Of course we knew that we were different. Ours is the only house in town that had a porch and I remember the most fragrant roses there. 
After breakfast, the whole servant's family would come in, and there would be a reading of a chapter in the Bible, and the singing of a hymn. My mother taught piano as her mission. A mountain rose just a few feet back from our house. On top, there was a pagoda built to incarcerate evil spirits. Most of the religion that lapped around us in this tiny village was folk religion, which centers in evil spirits, of which they're innumerable and mostly bad. So the Christian message that my parents brought gave a certain population in this town a spiritual anchorage that the folk religion that lapped around them did not. When we looked out a uh, back window in cold weather as well as warm, we would see people on the mountain doing their Tai Chi Chuan, you know, early in the morning. And even though the, as you know, the gestures are so graceful, choreographed, looks as much like a dance as a physical exercise, in the cold weather you could see the steam coming from their body because of the intensity of the metabolic processes that were released by these gestures. You brought this with you. <laughs> this is my first primer because though our uh, education was English, three afternoons a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they would import a tutor and he would give us uh, uh, the rudiments of a Chinese education. You remember it still? I don't even have to look at the words, but they found it goes, Shall I translate? Sure. The meaning is Chinese too. Big brother is big. Little brother is little. Big brother carries little brother. Good big brother. Good little brother. I love you. You love me. You see the family emphasis coming in right in the first words that they read. While you were doing that, I was singing. Uh I was repeating, see John run, see Mary run, <laughs> look, see. Look and see, and that's illustrative too, because we are empiricists in the West. It's the fruition in modern science which arose in the West and nowhere else. So what would you say has been the essence of Confucianism's contribution to the world? It, I, I would say it is in the area of social relationship. Uh, nothing is more important in Confucianism than the five constant relationships. And these are the five places where human lives intersect. The first is parent and child. The second is spouse and spouse. The third is elder brother and younger brother. The fourth is elder friend and younger friend. And the fifth is ruler and subject. Now, as every individual makes its way, his or her way through society, we're always in the midst of these cross currents of human relationship and it's exactly within that weather system of these currents going on all the time and how we comport ourselves in the face of those currents that our destiny depends. 
No, this is not yogis up in the caves for 40 years by themselves. Confucius uh, had no use for that as a way to become human. We work out our humanity in these cross currents of human relationship. But now, how do we face them? It's like uh, uh, our wings, everything depends on how our wings are set. If they're tilted at the right angle, then as we, these currents of human relationships come towards us every day, we will mount and our full humanity will blossom. But if our wings are slightly tipped downward, then we'll go devolving into the atrocities that human life can lead to. Now, what is the secret of whether the wings are tipped up or tipped down? And their word is Ren. Ren, which uh, in terms of the pictograph, it's composed of uh, two radicals. The first is for a human being. You have a torso and two legs. And then the second is two lines, two human beings. So Ren is the ideal relationship between any two human beings. And the heart of that relationship is empathy. Can I empathize with your feeling and your interest and to the extent that we I can then my wings are tipped up and moving through these human as these human relationships come at us every day why my maturity will increase A sound man's heart is not shut within itself, but it's open to the hearts of others. If it is sincere enough, it will feel the heartbeats of others as if they were its own. Oh, don't. Yes, the character for love, and you have highlighted the character for heart, which is right at the center of the sentiment of love. Just one last step. In this ongoing Confucian project, of human maturing or fulfillment, quest to, to become, he would say, to become fully human because this is our potential in life. It goes, this empathy, Ren, this quality of empathy uh, goes like ripples of circles into wider, wider confines. Beginning first, I try to overcome my self-centeredness in the family and have their empathize with their interests equal to myself. But if you do that, then you have a kind of nepotism. So the next step is to break beyond the family uh, to the community, your town. But if you stop there, then you've got provincialism. So you should extend this empathy to your own people. All uh, black-haired children of Han. But if you stop there, then you've got nationalism. So you've got to expand that empathy to the whole world in the, among the four seas. All men are brothers, and we would add, all women are sisters. And now you might say, well, we've reached the limit. Oh no, because the human scene is set within the cosmos. And therefore, it's a mistake 
that because, to think that because Confucius did emphasize the human, it is a kind of humanism, stops with humanism. No, we have to empathize with the universe, with all nature. It's the imperative of the social order, of our living together in a civilized way. That is absolutely, I said, sorry to say absolute, almost absolutely true, because uh, again, we have to beware of mistaking this emphatically human emphasis for the all of his, but he did believe in heaven. And he did say, heaven only is great, earth is small. Therefore, it's not just a, a stunted humanism, it's a humanism in a cosmic environment. Somewhere you wrote that, that Confucius believed he was creating our second nature. What do you mean by that term? Our, what was he doing in creating our second nature? Our, our primary nature is biological, physical, DNA and the like. Our second nature is cultural, and he was creating a culture which would shore up these ideals in the direction that would bring human fulfillment. And that's why he was so attentive to cultural forms, the dance, the music. It is a wonderful line because I happen to be audio sensitive that on one occasion uh, he heard a melody on a flute and he lost his taste for meat for three months. <laughs> 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 What did he think music, poetry, painting did for us and for civilization? In the long run, he thought, what will prevail in international relationships is the culture of the countries in question. Kublai Khan conquered China physically, but after a generation while well, you find Kublai Khan apprenticing himself to his conquered slave in trying to create calligraphy and already he is hoping against hope that he will be mistaken for a Chinese. There is the melting pot culture that by its own refinement attracts people to emulate. Did all of this influence your decision when you came back to the United States to make comparative religion the work of your life? When I came to this country, why, well, uh, at first I thought I was going right back as a missionary. How old were you then? I was 17. And my only American male role model was my father. And so I grew up assuming that missionaries were what American boys grew up to be. But I was totally unprepared for the dynamism of the West. You know, never mind that it was Central Methodist College, enrollment 600, uh, in Fayette, Missouri, population 3,000. Uh, compared with Podunk, China, it was the big time and the bright lights, and by two weeks, uh, China had faded into a happy memory. I wasn't gonna squander my life in the backwaters of rural China. But I just moved over uh, across the street, so to speak, 
um, and I'd be a minister. And then uh, that held in place for about two years. And then in my junior year, something truly extraordinary and amazing and unexpected happened. I, I entered college and I wanted to be big man on campus. And so I entered all the organizations I could get into. That was my extroverted nature. Then something happened in my junior year and I ended trying to get out of as many organizations as I could in order to focus on my studies. Why? I, what happened? Well, what happened was there was a little discussion group that the philosophy professor organized. You know, these are the good old days of education. We were in and out of our uh, professors' homes all the time, small town and so on. And once a month, why he would have us over and we would discuss a philosophical issue. I suppose it must have been mounting in me all evening. As we walked back to our dormitory, a uh, little cluster of us, four or five, uh, stood in the dorm halls until after midnight, just hammer and tong, talking about these uh, as uh, <laughs> unlikely a group of peripatetics <laughs> as you would find anywhere. But it kept on going as I went alone to my room until, I don't know when, maybe around one or two o'clock, uh, it's just like my mind detonated, uh, demolishing mental stockades. And it was almost like an mystical experience, uh, like ideas were almost visible, the platonic form were out there, you could almost touch it, and just uh, receding from me endlessly. Here I was, a young man, these were ideas, a young man with my whole life uh, ahead of me to explore these ideas. I wonder if I slept at all that night, but that was a changing point, and after that, why, well, never mind the organization, to focus on this, and that has stayed in play. That has been, you know, the life-giving uh, life lure. Five decades ago, that life-giving lure led him to a teaching post at Washington University in St. Louis. The world of ideas revealed to him in college now beckoned. Just teaching about religion wasn't enough, and he began to explore spiritual practices that to most Americans surely seemed exotic in 1948. He found himself once again on the verge of two traditions, Christianity and Hinduism, as he submitted to weekly tutorials with the renowned scholar Swami Saprakashananda. Houston Smith first met the Hindu master in St. Louis at a religious and philosophical organization called the Vedanta Society. There was a moment in St. Louis, a few years, where uh, I had a dual role. I uh, was listed as associate minister at the Methodist Church nearby and was uh, president of the Vedanta Society of St. Louis, which was uh, teaching me metaphysical profundities that uh, my church certainly was not preaching, that this all came to a head on Christmas Eve because uh, there would be a four o'clock Christmas service uh, at the church, which would be a family affair in the afternoon so the children could come. And that was wonderful, Christmas music, silent night, all of that, all of the magic of Christmas and being together with our children was just glorious, but then 
we would go home, have a supper, uh, put the children to bed early for their early rising, for the, and then I would slip off to the Vedanta Society where every Christmas Eve, Swami Satpakashananda, he never varied his title, was Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And even though in the Methodist Church there was all the happiness of the family togetherness, when it came to spiritual death, what he said, the Swami said about the incarnation, fed my soul more than any Christmas sermon in the Methodist Church. The reason? The Swami literally believed in the incarnation, that God had metaphysically become a human being. Now you see, I'm a living witness to the fact that I have drawn spiritual succor from an alien tradition which, however, was true to the metaphysical teachings of original Christianity more than my church, which had been diluted by modernism. I cite that simply as an evidence of the missionary enterprise to this country and how it uh, bears fruit. I've been asked many times, uh, son of missionary, do you believe in the missionary enterprise? And uh, the, my answer is yes, both ways. Uh, I know from experience that my parents brought a word to our small town that had never heard of Christianity that was crucially important for a number of people. Now that I'm older, I likewise welcome the missionaries from uh, Asia that uh, are uh, very much uh, in evidence in our own culture, and I think the same thing is happening. There are people who uh, have been wounded by their own tradition, wounded Christian, wounded uh, Jews. What do you mean wounded Christian, wounded Jew? Uh, the, their experience with their institutionalized religion has rubbed them the wrong way. And therefore, those negative features that they, excessive moralism, and we've got the truth, exclusivism, uh, that has become their image of what Christianity and Judaism basically is, and therefore they want none of it and find it difficult to uh, pierce through that to the inner meaning. What are these emissaries from these other cultures, these other wisdom traditions, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Shintoism, what are they bringing to this country? They are bringing an emphasis on direct experience and a method for attaining that. I happen to think that the World's historical religions divide into three families, each with their distinctive characteristic. The West is more geared to nature and working out our destiny in concert with nature. I'll come back with a moment. The Chinese are more geared to the social problem relationship not to nature so much as to other human beings. And the South Asian family, Hinduism and Buddhism, are oriented towards the inter inner self and therefore became 
historically the world's psycho introspective psychology. And I know, in, in fact, there are several movements in psychology today that are, in an effect, oriented towards India because they believe that India, through this concentration, discovered things about the human psyche that the West has yet to catch up with. And let me tell you one little uh, moment which to me was an eye-opener as to what that meant. Uh, I, the, the, we are familiar with the waking state and we're familiar with the dream state, which is very different. And third, we now know about dreamless sleep. If I were to ask you uh, last night when you were in your dreamless state, were you aware then I'm not aware of having dreamed last night. Yeah, but you know you did. Everybody dreams every night. But uh, one also enters into dreamless state. And what I ask my students is, we know this is true. The scientists have evidence of that they are tr true. When you were in your dreamless state last night, were you aware? And most of them, and I even force a vote on them, and most of them, or uh, no, I battled my teacher, my Swami, seven years on this instant, this issue, insisting that I was not aware. And he said, no, that's wrong, you were aware. Well, I came back, well, at least I wasn't aware that I was aware. And he said, that cuts no ice because Note how difficult it is to remember your dreams. We know about that. When I wake up and I have an interesting dream and I want to tell Kendra in the morning, I have to consciously say it through in my mind, hoping that I will remember it because it volatizes so fast. When we come to consciousness, that it's very hard to remember even dream. Now, my teacher said, the dreamless sleep is deeper than the dream state. That state is of utter bliss. And uh, were it not the fact that every 24 hours, every human being establishes direct contact with that experience of utter joy, we simply could not keep up our hope in human life. The hard knocks, the pressures, the dismal aspects would just overwhelm us and we would not be able to, to keep our spirits buoyant. So that's why sleep is restorative. That, One absolutely. Of reasons, yeah. One of the reasons, physiologically, of course, but spiritually also. So the good Hindu would say, there are realms of gold hidden deep. That is the realm. This would explain to Hindus, the Hindus' obsession with the oneness of reality and the whole importance of yoga of trying to get in touch with this inner unity, this inner reality, wouldn't it not? It would, yeah. When in the West we think of yoga, we think of a specific kind, which is called hatha yoga. Now, hatha yoga deals with physical exercises, postures, positions, poses. But in India, Hatha yoga is embedded as only one of eight steps in a complete system of personal transformation. If you were to carve it out of its place in the eightfold sequence, then it would be purely calisthenics. But Overwhelmingly in India, it plays its part as the third step 
in a program of transformation designed to pick you up where you are and set you down as a remade human being. For me, I do my best to adhere to uh, the Eightfold Path of Raj Yoga in which this is only a component. It happens to be the most visible, <laughs> so it lends itself to the media, but it is far from the most important. Houston Smith rises early in the morning to practice yoga. In 1955, he introduced the ancient Hindu discipline to a wider audience through his televised course on world religions. We have then, the Hindus say, to make a journey from ourselves as we now are to our real selves, which is divine. And that brings us to our topic for this evening. Let me summarize it with a word. We're going to talk tonight about the yogas. Now this is a very strange word to us. In fact, uh, uh, I find myself smiling in a Western context whenever I turn to this word because well, we associate it with the bizarre, the fantastic, the occult, maybe even the fraudulent a little bit, the fakers. Uh, this is where they come to, we come to the famous yoga position. And I want to just show you what this is. There's always a, uh, a little humor involved in this because it's so strange to us. But nevertheless, I think we ought to know what this is. They say the most effective position, which will still the mind, is the so-called yoga, the lotus posture. You, it doesn't go very well with shoes, which is why I've taken mine off. Actually, it doesn't go very well with trousers either, but we'll forget about that tonight. You put one foot up here in the lap, then all you have to do is to bring the other foot around like that. The spine must be completely straight. Now they say when you get used to this, the point is that this will put your mind at rest and keep out the bodily distractions better than any there other There you are position. with your fashionable well, crew cut, <laughs> sitting on your desk in the lotus position. That was in the 1940s and 50s. Not many people knew much about yoga, Allah, Buddhism, meditation in this country. And I remember that's true. I remember one little item at the life that came back to me from the mail and it was on just one of these quickie cards that fold together and not even an envelope and it said, Dear Professor Smith, this letter will not be long because I cannot write well in my present position. I have my left foot in my right pocket and my right foot in my left pocket. How do I unwind? I am waiting your next program. <laughs> uh, but it caught on because, possibly because it was also new to the people. Have you been doing it ever since the 40s when you were introduced to it? Have you been practicing yoga? Yes. And what happens to you when you're <laughs> well, I make no claims except uh, uh, it makes the days go better. I'll just leave it at that. The days go better uh, when I do it. And my favorite happens to be the headstand. And that, uh, that may be because <laughs> there's a down <coughs> downside to it. I, uh, I have to laugh because I... Uh, I think maybe it's my favorite because I'm so greedy with my time and I, uh, it is my understanding that you get more metabolic toll in that position than any of the other postures you can strike.
Now, this is a very complicated concept for people, so let's stay with it a moment. Describe yoga as if you were talking to a stranger who had never heard about it before. Right. Yoga, it comes from our same word as yoke, and so basically it means to unite yoke, and uh, by extension, unite the human spirit to the ultimate spirit. Now, in the classic yoga exercises, it moves three stages, actually four. It begins with certain moral preliminaries, because if your life is in chaos and troubles with other people, you aren't going to be able to have a still mind, so straighten out your life in basic morality. Having done that, then it moves on to the body, because we are psychosomatic people. We have bodies and we have minds, and we're learning more and more about the interface between those two. So, the work with the body begins with certain uh, asanas. Uh, they, asanas is postures, and some of them are to produce flexibility and to keep our muscles from just contracting over age. But then the other aim is to quiet the body, to still the body. You know, you can lie flat and you'll be quiet, but how about being alert? Having done that, they move on to the breath, as it were, the doorway between the mind and the body. And breath is, is, is essential to this. It's really a concentration of the breath, isn't it? The breath is probably the most useful thing to concentrate on because it is like a bridge from the physical. It is physical. Air is physical. And yet it's invisible and it is so diaphanously physical that it is a natural link between our bodies and our consciousness. And then from the body we move on to the mind. If it wanders, you simply notice that it's wandering and then come back, bring it back to counting your breaths, which is a good way to bring the focus of the mind. And then finally, this leads into a stage where you lose awareness of yourself and 100% you're focused on what you are, uh, that little Josh Dick, the burning ember, or whatever it is, and then beyond that, even that disappears, and the mind is simply alone with the infinite, with no imagery at all. Well, I have more than just an intellectual curiosity about this, because even as we talk, I'm undergoing a program in cardiac conditioning, right here in New York at Beth Israel Hospital. Oh, uh, good, good. And the third part of this program is elementary yoga. Yeah. And I'm only on novitiate. I'm brand new. <laughs> I've just been well, welcome to the to club. It. But I wish we could find words to explain to people what words barely hint at, because it is a, a changing consciousness oh, yeah. that somehow calms the emotions, reliberates the mind from this frenetic Dang. running and by the end of the hour uh, well there's an old Taoist saying to the mind that is still the world surrenders yeah. and there is a moment at which it simply seems my life is li as still as the reflection of the moon in the calm of the lake. Wonderful, wonderful. But again, yeah. these are only words, they're not the experience. Of course, of course. But as they say, they are pointers to the moon, even they are not the moon, but they give, as you spoke, you know, I get the sense of what you're saying. But it's not a weird experience, it's just an unusual experience because we are so, we in the West, are so unaccustomed to this kind of natural state of yeah. being. I hope this is not a metaphor for 
our whole conversation, <laughs> Bill, because when one gets into the things of the Spirit, why, uh, it, it really, words can do something, but it is so ultimately and basically an experiential matter that uh, if one hears only the words, why, that old, old Hindu prayer, O thou before whom all words fail. Oh, wonder, recoil. O thou before whom all words recoil. You know, it's like we throw our uh, flaming torches towards the sun, but they never make it to the sun. They uh, fall down to the earth. Next on The Wisdom of Faith with Houston Smith, The Power of a Life. This is charisma, and the charisma comes from that spirit. The force of tradition. I envy uh, the rituals of the Sabbath. Reflections of the One Creator. 